Welcome to the Banner of Truth magazine podcast, where each week we bring you selected content from the magazine for your encouragement and edification. Our first selection this week is entitled A Godly Father's Counsel to His Children. It appeared in the 364th edition of the Banner magazine, dated January 1994, and was written by Richard Brooks, who at the time was minister at York Evangelical Church. One of the most familiar texts from the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, reads, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. This great text forms a part of that section of the book which begins in chapter 1 and extends at least to the end of chapter 7. It comprises the godly counsel of a father to his son on spiritual and practical matters. My son is a phrase repeated many times throughout these early chapters. For Proverbs, as well as being a book for everyone, has a very great deal to say to young people. It's important to underscore that the counsel here from father to son is upon spiritual matters. Fathers and mothers too will counsel, teach, warn and instruct their children upon a vast range of practical matters for life. Proverbs is as practical a book as one will find anywhere in the Bible. But the thing of supreme value here, and we need to take note of it, is that the most important counsel of all which parents can give is spiritual counsel. Counsel in spiritual things is found often in Proverbs. If we love our children, we shall tell them so often what they mean to us and how grateful we are to God for giving them to us. And we shall prove this and demonstrate this to them most lovingly and significantly by paying attention to their souls and urging them to pay attention to their souls. We need to bring them up under the preaching of God's word. Bishop Ryle has a very direct challenge precisely on this point of our love for our children. Quote, No interest should weigh with you so much as their eternal interests. No part of them should be so dear to you as that part which will never die. In every step you take about them, in every plan and scheme and arrangements that concern them, do not leave out the mighty question, how will this affect their souls? He adds, soul love is the soul of all love. To pet and pamper and indulge your child as if this world was all he had to look to and this life the only season for happiness To do this is not true love, but cruelty. It is treating him like some beast of the earth, which has but one world to look to, and nothing after death. It is hiding from him that grand truth which he ought to be made to learn from his very infancy, that the chief end of his life is the salvation of his soul. Examples from famous Christians. A number of instances of a father's spiritual concern for and godly counsel to his children are preserved in the letters of past saints. Charles Spurgeon. The first letter C.H. Spurgeon's son Charles received from his father during one of Spurgeon's visits abroad begins, My dear Charlie, and ends, Your loving father. Included in the letter are these words, I trust that you will prove by the whole of your future life that you are truly converted to God. Your actions must be the chief proof. Remember, trees are known by their fruit and Christians by their deeds. God bless you for ever and ever. Then there is J. H. Thornwell. James Henry Thornwell wrote the following words to his 15-year-old son Gillespie during 1859. I have endeavoured to commit you all to God. And there is nothing on which my heart is so much set as to see you all enlisted in the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. My cup of earthly happiness would be full if you and Jimmy and Charlie were only true Christians. You would then be safe for time and eternity. Depend upon it, my dear son. You will never repent of it if you should now give your heart unto the Lord. Let me beg you to seek this summer the salvation of your soul. 
You will have time to think and read and pray. Write to me that you are not neglecting the one thing needful. Then we have John Elias. One of the mighty servants of God in Wales in past days was John Elias. Writing from London on the 7th of April 1830 to his son John, he included these words. Beware lest anything that occurs should be the means of intercepting your communion with God and marring your soul's spiritual welfare. Strive to confide in the Lord as to your temporal and eternal concerns and thereby enjoy calmness and peace. The Lord is able to support and direct you in all your concerns and throughout your pilgrimage. He is infinitely wise to see what is most profitable for you. He is most rich, possessing all things. He is almighty and able to do all things. And he is most gracious and ready to bestow gifts upon the most unworthy. And those that put their trust in him shall want no manner of thing that is good. He has been most merciful to us as a family and showed compassion to us in many difficulties and changes, as you know. Then we have Andrew Bonar. Bonar wrote from Glasgow on the 28th of May 1892 to his son James to thank him for a birthday present he'd received from him for his 82nd birthday. He begins, My dear James, and he signs, Your affectionate father. And Bonar wrote as follows. It was in the year 1830 that I found the Saviour, or rather that he found me and laid me on his shoulders rejoicing and I have never parted company with him all these 62 years. Christ the Saviour has been to me my true portion, my heaven begun, and my earnest prayer and desire for you will always be that you may find not only all I ever found in Christ, but a hundredfold more every year. And then we have Jonathan Edwards. It's appropriate to include in this brief selection a letter from Jonathan Edwards. Written from Stockbridge to his son Jonathan on the 27th of May 1755 and signed Your Tender and Affectionate Father, it is most earnest, gracious and spiritual in tone. Jonathan Jr. must surely have been moved, stirred and instructed by it. Here's part of the letter. Though you are a great way off from us, yet you are not out of our minds. I am full of concern for you, often think of you and often pray for you. Take heed that you do not forget or neglect him. Always set God before your eyes and live in his fear and seek him every day with all diligence. For he and he alone can make you happy or miserable as he pleases. And your life and health and the eternal salvation of your soul and your all in this life and that which is to come depends on his will and pleasure. The week before last on Thursday, David died, whom you knew and used to play with, and who used to live at our house. His soul is gone into the eternal world. Whether he was prepared for death, we do not know. This is a loud call of God to you to prepare for death. You see that they that are young die as well as those that are old. David was not much older than you. Remember what Christ said that you must be born again or you never can see the kingdom of God. Never give yourself any rest unless you have good evidence that you are converted and become a new creature. You know not how soon you may die and therefore had need always to be ready. And then we have an example from David Livingston. David Livingston writes from Africa to his wife and children back home in 1853. And he writes this. My dear Robert, Agnes and Thomas and Oswell, here is another little letter for you all. I should like to see you much more than write to you and speak with my tongue rather than with my pen. But we are far from each other, very, very far. I remember, though I am far off, Jesus, our good and gracious Jesus, is ever near both you and me. And then I pray to him to bless you and make you good. He is ever near. Remember this if you feel angry or naughty. Jesus is near you and sees you, and he is so good and kind. He is always watching you and keeping you in safety. It is very bad to sin, to do any naughty things, or speak angry or naughty words before him. My dear children, take him as your guide, your helper, 
your friend and saviour through life. What are we to learn from these letters of fatherly counsel? Such counsel is greatly needful, and we who are parents are failing in our duty before God and to our children if we neglect it, regard it as unimportant, fail to make time for it or leave it to someone else. I use the word counsel rather than advice. Although the two words are often used more or less interchangeably, it has to be said that advice has a certain take-it-or-leave-it nature to it, and there is bad advice as well as good advice, while counsel implies a godly and firm directing in the ways of God. This is the way. Walk in it. It goes without saying that we are in continual dependence upon God himself to engage in this great work. We cannot do it in our own strength or our own wisdom. Moreover, he alone can bless it and make it fruitful and effective. We cannot but notice the rich and gracious promise which God affixes to the performance of the required duty. We are not only exhorting our children, verses 5 and 6, but are at the same time pointing them to it and assuring them of the blessed promise of God, verse 6. The promise here is for newborn souls who have been saved by grace. The Lord will direct their paths, superintend their course through the sinful world and lead them to heaven itself to glory. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Psalm 84, 7. Is this how we who are parents speak to our children or write to them and cry to God for them? Is this how we show them true soul love? And if we are still young, is yours the rich privilege under God of having a father and mother who show their desire to train you not only for earth, but for heaven? Then do you pay attention to what they say. In 2007, The Banner published Raising Children God's Way by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, minister at Westminster Chapel in London. This paperback consists of material that Lloyd-Jones preached as part of a series of expositions of the Book of Ephesians, which The Banner publishes in eight volumes. A side note here is that we publish this everywhere except the USA, where we don't have the rights. What you are about to hear is an excerpt from the end of the book, in which Dr. Lloyd-Jones deals with the theme of a godly upbringing, what it means to bring children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, as Ephesians 6 verse 4 says. In this section, he highlights first how not to bring children up in this way, and then outlines how Christian parents may best serve the spiritual interests of their children. We must never force a child to a decision. What trouble and havoc has been wrought by this? Isn't it marvellous, say the parents, my little so-and-so, a mere youngster, decided for Christ. Pressure had been brought to bear in the meeting, but that should never be done. You are violating the personality of the child. In addition, of course, you are displaying a profound ignorance of the way of salvation. You can make a little child decide anything. You have the power and the ability to do so. But it is wrong. It is unchristian. It is not spiritual. In other words, we must never be too direct in this matter, especially with a child. Never be too emotional. If your child feels uncomfortable as you are talking to him about spiritual matters, or if you are talking to someone else's child and he feels uncomfortable, your method is obviously wrong. The child should never be made to feel uncomfortable. If he does, it is because you are too direct, or you are too emotional, or you are bringing pressure to bear. That is not the way to do this work. And then a couple of paragraphs later, Dr. Lloyd-Jones resumes, Do not force them to a decision. I know the anxiety felt by a parent. It is very natural. But if we are spiritual, if we are, quote, filled with the Spirit, unquote, we shall never violate a personality, never bring any unfair pressure to bear upon a child. So, our teaching must never be too direct or too emotional. It must never be done in such a manner 
that the children are made to feel disloyal to us if they do not profess belief. That is unforgivable. What then is the true way? Let me give some suggestions. There used to be at one time in people's houses, and I still see them sometimes, a little card hanging on the wall with this sentence on it. Christ is the head of this house. I am not an advocate of putting up such cards or texts, but there was something good in the idea. In the Old Testament, we read that instructions were given to the children of Israel to, quote, write them, the words of the Lord, on the doorposts, unquote. The reason being that we are such forgetful creatures. The early Protestants used to paint the Ten Commandments on the walls of their churches, partly for the same reason. But whether you do or do not display a card, the important point is that the impression should always be given that Christ is the head of the house or the home. How is that impression given? Chiefly by your general conduct and example. The parents should be living in such a way that the children should always have a feeling that they themselves are under Christ, that Christ is their head. The facts should be obvious in their conduct and behavior. Above all, there should be an atmosphere of love. Quote, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Unquote. That is our controlling text in this as in all these particular applications. The fruit of the Spirit is love, and if the home is filled with an atmosphere of the love produced by the Spirit, most of its problems are solved. That is what does the work. Not the direct pressures and appeals, but an atmosphere of love. What else? General conversation. At the table, or wherever you are, general conversation is most important. We listen perhaps to the news on the radio, and conversation begins about the news. Great affairs are being mentioned, international affairs, politics, industrial troubles, etc. A part of our task in bringing up our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord is to see to it that even such general conversation is always conducted in Christian terms. We should always bring in the Christian point of view. The children will hear other people talking about the same things. They may be walking along the road, and they hear two men arguing about the very things that they had heard discussed at home. At once, they will notice one big difference. The whole approach was different at home. In other words, the Christian point of view must be brought into the whole of life. Whether you are discussing international affairs or local affairs, personal matters or business matters, whatever it is, everything must be considered under this general heading of Christianity. This is a most vital point, for when this is done, the children unconsciously become aware of the fact that there is a governing principle in the lives of their parents. Their thinking and everything else about them is different from all that they see and hear in the unbelieving world. The whole atmosphere is different. Thus, the children, gradually and partly unconsciously, become aware that there is such a thing as a Christian point of view. That is a real achievement. Once they get hold of that fact, the problem becomes much easier. The next matter is the answering of questions. There the Christian parent gets a great opportunity. It is sometimes extremely difficult, I know, but we are given the opportunity of answering questions. I like the way in which the matter is introduced in the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy, in the twentieth verse. Quote, and when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies, and the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Unquote. And so on. In other words, a day will come when the children will ask a question such as this. Why don't you do this or that? The father and mother of my little friend do this. Why don't you? There you have been given an opportunity of bringing up your child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. 
But if we are to take it, we must know the right answer and be able to supply it. You cannot give a reason for the hope that is in you. You cannot bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord unless you know your Bible and its teaching. Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? My friends' fathers spend their evenings in public houses. You don't. They spend their evenings in clubs. They spend their nights dancing. You don't. Why? What is the difference? When questioned in that way, you must not brush the child aside and say, Well, we are all different, you see, and this is how we prefer it. No, you say rather to your child, We are all alike at heart to begin with, and we behave in this different way not because we are naturally better than others. That is not the explanation. It is not that I have one temperament and the other fathers have other temperaments. We are all born in sin. We are all slaves by nature to various things. There is something wrong within us all. There is an evil principle in us all, and none of us knows God truly. You see, the difference is this, that God has caused me to see how wrong certain things are. But I would still be like your friends, fathers, were it not that I believe and know that God sent his only Son, the Lord Jesus, of whom you have heard, into the world to rescue us, to deliver us. Thus you introduce the gospel. You have to decide how much to give. It depends upon the age of the child. But answer his questions. Let him know. Let him know exactly, when he asks his question, why you live as you do. You must not foist it on him. You must not preach at him. But if he asks his question, then tell him. Tell him very simply. Tell him more and more as he gets older. But always be ready to answer the questions. Know your facts, understand your gospel, build yourself up in it, so that you can impart it, and pass it on. Thus you will be able to bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Then you can guide their reading. Get them to read good biographies. Biographies will appeal to them. Guide their reading in various ways. Turn their minds in the right direction and familiarize them with the glories of the Christian faith in action. What else? Be careful always, whenever you have a meal, to return thanks to God for it, and to ask His blessing upon it. This is rarely done today by any except those who are Christians. If your children become accustomed to hearing you thanking God, and returning thanks, and asking a blessing, it will do something for them. Go further, have what is called a family altar, which means that once at least every day you should meet together as a family round the word of God. The father, as the head of the house, should read a portion of scripture and offer a simple prayer. It need not be long, but let him acknowledge God and let him thank God for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the children hear the word of God regularly. If they ask questions about it, answer them. Give them instruction as you are able to do so. Be wise, be judicious. Do not make of it something distasteful, hateful or boring. Make it such that they will look forward to it, something they will like and in which they find delight. In other words, to sum it all up, what we have to do is to make Christianity attractive. We should give our children the impression that the most wonderful thing in the world is Christianity and that there is nothing in life comparable to being a Christian. We should create within them the desire to be like us. They see us, and they see the joy that we have in it, and the way we marvel and wonder at it all. They should be saying to themselves, I am longing to be as old as they are, so that I can enjoy it as they obviously do. Our method must never be mechanical, legal, repressive. Our testimony must never be forced but in all we are and do and say, let them know that we ourselves are bond slaves of Jesus Christ, that God in his grace has opened our eyes and awakened us to the most glorious thing in the world, and that our greatest desire for them is that they may enter into the same knowledge and have the same joy and have the highest privilege possible in this world, that of serving the Lord and living to the praise of the glory of His grace. 
Whatever your work, whether business or profession or manual labor or preaching, do all things to the glory of God. And in that way, you will bring up your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Thank you for listening to the Banner of Truth magazine podcast. To subscribe to the magazine in print or digital formats, or both, see the show notes or visit banneroftruth.org.